All right, welcome everyone. In this video, we're doing a 16.4 style problem. We're here in fall semester 2016. We're gonna be doing problem number three. So again, 16.4 was Green's theorem. And we have to remember we can use Green's theorem whenever we have a closed curve. And that's the main condition is that we need a closed curve. If it's, it's even better when it's going around with a positive orientation. That's the same thing as counterclockwise. So notice in this case, we do have a nice simply closed curve. So that's good. Um, but however, we're going clockwise. So this kind of throws a little bit of a hiccup into these things. I'm going to go ahead and assume that we have counterclockwise for a little while, and then we're going to talk about how do we switch and make it, you know, oriented in this negative direction, in the clockwise direction. Okay, so again, for Green's theorem, we need a nice simply closed curve. This is a nice simply closed curve, right? We start and end at the same point. In this case, I believe it's the point two zero. And we're going to be transversing this clockwise. For Green's theorem, Green's theorem says, hey, instead of doing a line integral, right, usually it's like p dx plus q dy, something like this. Instead of doing that line integral, we can go ahead and swap that out for a double integral. So long as we evaluate q sub x, that's the partial derivative of q with respect to x, minus p sub y. Right, over the double integral. And the big thing that I, you know, I'm drawing and I'm bringing this up for is that right, we know very clearly what C is. C is this curve. Again, we're going to be transferencing it clockwise here for a little bit. But the question is, what is the D? Right? When we switch this into a double integral, we have to switch from C to D. D is a two-dimensional region. And the claim is that D is the region kind of bounded by this curve. So it's this region here that's inside of C. And that's the power behind, you know, having a closed curve here. So we have it bounded inside. This right here is my region D. So this is the region that I'm going to be integrating over when I evaluate out this double integral. I also want to take a, a second to notice that nowhere in this problem does it say that you have to use Green's theorem. Right? You could evaluate out that line integral, but the claim is you would be a lot sadder. Right? In order to evaluate out this line integral, you would have to evaluate the line integral over the inside of the circle. Right? So you'd have to parametrize this. And then you'd have to evaluate out the line integral you know, maybe on this piece right here. And then you'd have to evaluate out the line integral on the outer circle. And then you would have to evaluate out the line integral on this last line. Right? And so you'd have to evaluate out four line integrals. You'd have to parametrize them all. You'd have to find R prime. You'd have to take the dot product. Right? You'd have to evaluate all this stuff. It would take forever. So even though it does not say you have to use Green's theorem, we know that whenever you can use one of these shortcuts, like the fundamental theorem of line integrals or Green's theorem, you definitely want to. Right? So in this case, we see the closed curve, and we know that Green's theorem is one of the things that we have in our arsenal, right? This is one of the things that we can use to solve problems. So that's why we're going to go ahead and do it. Even though it doesn't say that we have to use Green's theorem, we pretty much need to, right? It would take a long time otherwise. All right, so I've spent a, a decent amount of time with the motivation and how we're going to tackle this problem. Now let's actually get to it. Remember, this is my P, this is my Q. So again, we're evaluating out Q sub X, the partial derivative of Q with respect to X. So Q sub X, that's going to be 4, minus P sub Y. So the partial derivative of P with respect to Y, well, that's going to be 0, right? Because there are no Ys there. So we can factor out that 4 if we'd like. And now it really just comes down to an area question, right? Because the double integral of 1 dA is going to be area over this region. So we can do a couple of things. You can either, you know, if you're at all hesitant, because this is a little bit of an advanced structure to be calculating the area of, you can evaluate out the double integral, and that will work perfectly fine. I'm going to go ahead and interpret this in terms of area, though, and I'm going to evaluate it out that way. Maybe I'll at least set up the integral, and that way if you want to confirm... Oops. <laughs> Don't need that update quite yet. Yeah, that, I'll, I'll set up the integral, and that way if you want to confirm, you can. So let's go ahead. I'm going to do the area way first. It'll be a little bit faster. All right, so the area, what I'm going to think about is that I'm going to think about the overall circle here. So I'm going to go ahead... Let me shade in a little bit more here. I'm going to use purple. So I'm going to figure out the overall area of this semicircle. 
And then I'm going to subtract away that little one, which I'll shade in maybe orange, something like this. Okay, so the area of the overall circle, remember this is going to be pi r squared. So pi, my radius is 2 squared. But remember, it's only a half of a circle, so I'm going to take half of that. So that's going to be the purple, right? That's the overall, the bigger semicircle. And then I'm going to go ahead and subtract away the area of the inside circle, that smaller one. Again, this is going to be pi r squared. In this case, it's 1, right, because the radius is 1 here. And we're going to go ahead and take half of that. So that's going to be the area of that smaller inside circle. That's why I'm shading them like that. So if we go ahead and evaluate this out, we're going to have 4. And then we're going to have, let's see, 2 pi minus pi over 2. So let's see, 2 pi, that's the same thing as 4 halves pi minus pi over 2. So that's going to be 3 halves pi. And then we're going to multiply that by 4. So this is going to be, let's see, 12 halves pi. Or that's going to be the same thing as 6 pi. So 6 pi is my final answer. Again, interpreting this in terms of area is great. Uh, if, however, you wanted to actually set up the integration, right? So 4, when we switch, right, we have to decide how do we want to integrate this. And I think the most natural way to integrate this is certainly going to be in polar coordinates, right? We see a lot of concentric circles, things like that. So let's go ahead and do polar. So I'm going to do a dr and a d theta, which means that I need to switch this, right? My integration factor when switching into polar is r. And now let's go ahead and think about what should my limits of integration be for r? Well, I think I enter into the region, you know, as I travel outward, as I get bigger and bigger r values, I always seem to enter in through the circle of radius 1, right? So I'm going to enter in through r equals 1, and I always seem to exit through the circle of radius 2. So I always seem to exit through 2. Now, my thetas are a little bit more challenging, right? So it seems like my theta actually starts way down here, and my theta ends up here. So my theta is not going to start at 0, I would actually bring it down and start a little bit less than zero. That's going to be at negative pi over four. That's at negative, you know, 45 degrees. And then I'm going to go ahead and bring it up. And it's going to keep on going until we hit all the way over here. This is the biggest theta value right over here. That's going to be at, let's see, one pi over four, two pi over four, three pi over four. So three pi over four is going to be my maximum. And again, technically all this is hidden within this equation right here, y is equal to negative x. So this right here would be the setup. Again, if you were to evaluate this, we should get out the same answer, six pi. So you can go ahead and double check. But again, uh, interpreting it in terms of area is going to be a little bit faster. All right, so now that all of that is said and done, we have to go ahead and remember right, that we are transverse clockwise. Green's theorem works really well for counterclockwise. So if I want to transverse this clockwise, how does that influence my answer? And the claim is that it's off by a negative sign. Right? All of the work, right? again, whenever you're evaluating a line integral like this, you think about it in terms of work. right? All of the work that this vector field did and helped push some particle around this curve in the counterclockwise direction, remember it helped by a factor of 6 pi, this actually hurts if you're going in the opposite direction. It's going clockwise. So it helps going counterclockwise, but it hurts going clockwise. And so again, this is going to be hurting it by how much? Well, it's going to be, again, by a factor of 6 pi, but it's going to be hurting it. So we're going to get out negative 6 pi. So again, in order to employ Green's theorem, we needed to go around in this counterclockwise direction. So again, this was all work for counterclockwise. And so if you want clockwise... You're going to get the same result, but it's been going to be off by a factor of a negative one, right? So our final answer is 6 pi. In fact, let me, you know, just in case this confuses someone who looks at it later or something, let me go ahead and I want to erase this highlighted bit just so that they're not confused. So again, that was all for counterclockwise to use Green's theorem. To switch to clockwise, we need to have this extra negative sign. So my final answer is going to be negative 6 pi. All right, and that's all there is to this one. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you next time.